Welcome everyone. So today we'll be discussing a hugely important topic and one that's very close to my heart, and that is diversity and inclusion within our industry. Now, I think we're all aware of the huge benefits that diversity and inclusion can have for our industry. And that's namely more innovation through diversity of thought, more opportunities for all, better access to talent, and also better business performance. And whilst the industry is much better represented than ever before, it's no secret that with few notable exceptions, um, most of our senior positions are still held predominantly by men. And moreover, what we're seeing is there is a bit of a skills gap and there are some challenges attracting and retaining that next generation of talent that will be crucial to drive our industry forwards. So today, what we're going to do is have a look at some of the proactive ways that we as an industry can respond to these challenges to address the imbalances and think about some practical solutions that will help create a more inclusive, diverse and dynamic industry that will continue to thrive. So what we'll do is we'll start with introductions and I want to do this a little bit differently. Um, so I'll ask each of my panelists to introduce themselves, but also a little bit about how they entered the industry, what attracted them, you know, their first job and whether that was a positive or negative experience. Um, but I will start if that's okay. So I'm Harry John, I'm a senior consultant at CBRE, uh, working in the strategic advisory team where I lead digital and work with both occupiers and landlords to set the business case for investing in technologies. Um, but the reason why I'm here today moderating this panel is um, more to do with the job I do on the side, which is uh, three years ago, I co-founded an organization called Creation Property Network, which was set up to help support those people just at the start of their careers in property. So the people who are entering the industry to provide free events and networking for those people to give everyone the opportunity to start developing building their careers and, and having access to those important opportunities will help them to thrive. Um, and I, I started the industry, um, originally wanted to do architecture, went to university. It wasn't what I expected uh, because I don't have any connections in property, but thankfully I realized that I wanted to go down the surveying path quite early on, was able to switch to a different degree um, in real estate and had a huge amount of support. People around me who didn't know me, always willing to put out a helping hand, give me some advice. And I think that's such an important quality that I think everyone on this panel also um, holds dear. Um, but that's enough about me. So I will pass over to uh, firstly, Melanie to introduce herself. Thank you, Harry. Morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Melanie Leach. I'm Chief Executive of the British Property Federation, which is uh, the membership association um, for companies uh, working in real estate um, across the whole spectrum of diversity of activity that there is within real estate, which we'll probably come back to a little bit later on. Um, I'm a new entrant to the property industry. I came into this role almost six years ago with no background at all in uh, real estate. Uh, my background is mainly in the public sector. And my first job actually was as a police officer. Uh, I back, Way back, way back in the 80s, I pounded the streets of London uh, in the Metropolitan Police. So um, I guess I had quite an early uh, grounding and experience um, in some of the challenges that uh, all industries and all communities are facing around trying to um, truly um, represent, serve diverse communities. Um, and I can bring that into play if that comes into the conversation later on as well. But that was, for me, that was a fantastic first job because it taught me everything I hope I've learned around how to treat people with respect from very, very varied backgrounds, how to understand them, how to try and um, build relationships of trust and so on. And so that was a fantastic grounding for me, but I love this industry too. Um, I just find what turns me on, I suppose, is um, wanting to do some good and make a difference. Um, and that's driven my public sector career. And that's what I'm trying to do in my current role because property is such an anchor to all of our lives. It underpins everything we do throughout all of our uh, working, leisure, living, uh, you know, it, it's all underpinned by real estate. So it's a fantastic industry to be part of. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to the conversation today. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I'll move over to Sean next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Tompkins. I'm Chief Exec of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, commonly known as RICS by many people around the world. A global professional body 
um, set standards, uh, regulates against those standards and, and does absolutely everything it's can, it can with the profession to hold up public trust in the critical areas of real estate, infrastructure, construction and land. Um, I'm quite new to the industry as well. Even though I've been chief exec of the RICS now for just over 10 years, I spent the first 25, nearly 26 years of my life in financial services. So I've been in a completely different industry that I would probably say is 20 years more advanced than the industry uh, that I'm currently in, perhaps in thinking about some of the, the changes that we're discussing. I, I was headhunted uh, into this industry as someone who had experience of building brands and had worked in, in, in other parts of the world. Um, so I didn't really come with any connections. And, you know, probably from a lot of people's perspective, sitting here as global chief exec of uh, RICS, must think that I have some sort of uh, privileged network. Actually, not really. Uh, my, my parents were the first uh, people in their family to be able to buy their own house. Um, I had a very uh, modest uh, upbringing, um, but through drive and determination and uh, making some great connections in different parts of my industry, I found myself up as a chief exec of one of the largest professional bodies in the world. So hopefully I can share uh, that uh, everything is possible as well. Thanks, Sean. I love that. Love that. Um, so last but by no means least, Aisha. Thanks, Harry. Uh, so my story is um, not too dissimilar to both Sean's and Melanie's in that um, I'm new to or relatively new to the property industry as well. So I, too, have a financial services background uh, as I started out uh, as an investment banker and then a wealth advisor. And I'd say I even found the industry almost sort of by chance, um, but absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, started out by... Um, by, by going through what I call the sort of non-corporate route. So starting out building uh, a property portfolio for myself and then actually uh, setting up businesses that focus on the industry. Uh, so one is, you know, working with developers to focus on building affordable housing. And then the other two businesses are property communities uh, for diverse groups uh, within the sector. So one is focused on women and the other is focused on the black community and ethnic minority groups. Um, so as I said, my, my background is, is quite non-traditional. Um, and for me, it was about the, the excitement and the passion that I find within property. I love um, being able to be involved in creating homes for people. Um, I like the fact that the industry is so diverse in terms of the people um, that, that you meet. But there are sectors, as I said, that I, that I felt were underrepresented, which is why I decided to focus on creating businesses to, to help address that. Thanks, Aisha. That's, that's really interesting. And I love the fact that the three of you didn't come in a, into the industry in a traditional route. Um, you know, I, I knew from a very young age that I just wanted to work with buildings. I was that strange child that liked to go to B&Q and look at kitchens and bathrooms rather than Toys R Us. Um, and so when architecture wasn't for me, it was very much, how can I still work with buildings if I'm not designing them and, and what can I do? Um, but I guess that leads me into um, my first question, which is, I'll go to Melanie first. You, you said you entered the industry was it six years ago, but what was your perception of the built environment or the real estate industry before you joined it? And has that then changed the more that you've worked in the, in the industry? Yeah, I, I guess uh, my perception and my when I thought about uh, what the property industry was going to be was pretty similar to uh, the, the findings and research that Populous did for us uh, three years ago now, um, which was, you know, estate agents, housing development, um, middle class, you know, quite quite um, a rich industry, you know, the caricatures that you see of, you know, property developers are, are rich, aren't they? And they kind of swagger around and they, um, yeah. So, so I had, I had, you know, I had, insofar as I had any idea, um, that was probably, you know, not a wholly um, uh, unfamiliar picture, I say. And, and that, that, as I say, uh, with our popular survey, that proved to be actually, insofar as anyone knew anything in, in, in the survey that Populous did for us about the property industry, um, that was roughly what they thought too. 
Um, but actually very few people knew anything about the property industry at all. Um, and most people didn't really have an opinion about it. Um, we found there were sort of a few people that were very negative. Uh, there were a few people that were very positive. And in the middle, there's a sort of 50, more than 50% of people don't really know what the property industry is. And they certainly can't look beyond estate agency and, and housing. Um, so that, that's a kind of huge opportunity for all of us to tell a better story than the story we've managed to tell so far and to tell it in different places and to different people. And Aisha, how about you? What was your perception of the industry and how has that changed? So my, my perception was also that, you know, it was an industry um, typically for, for the wealthy. Again, my sort of perception of it was more around sort of property developers and people, you know, building homes to make themselves rich. Uh, less so much on the corporate side. And I think, you know, before I sort of, you know, got fully involved, I didn't really appreciate or understand just how many different roles and opportunities there are, you know, whether you want to work for corporate or whether you want to sort of, you know, set up your own business and, and be an SME. Um, I think just the breadth of what's available, um, you know, even today amazes me. But I think it's not something that is, um, you know, widely put out there. If you were to sort of, you know, go to a university or even younger people and sort of ask them what the property industry means to them, I think you, you'd get, you know, there's the sort of typical answers, but there is just so much more than that. Um, so that's something that has, you know, has, has definitely changed from when I sort of first came in. In terms of diversity, um, I think it, it was pretty much as I expected. Um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But I'd say that one of the positive changes is that I think um, people are open to listening, people are open to change. Um, so I definitely see how there can be positive things that can be done going forward to, to make it more inclusive and to have you know, you know, people from various different backgrounds, et cetera, coming in. Yeah, and I think that's, that's interesting. I remember back in my um, induction week, one of the phrases that was thrown around by some of the other graduates was that the industry is pale, male and, and stale, which I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to say out loud, but um, I think there is a lot more to it than that. And um, that's sometimes been a bit of a, a negative perception that, that's, that's had, that the industry has had, that it's very male dominated and, and predominantly white. I mean, Sean, what, what, what do you think? Look, I mean, I, I, you know, as I say, uh, I come from the financial services industry that had, you know, gone through quite a sort of revelation or revolution, I suppose, in terms of compliance, professionalism, um, digitalization, um, and and you know, uh, had spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, diversity as well and and and, and talent. So. I think when I first came in, you know, I, I saw an industry that was probably behind an industry that I'd known. But actually, whether I really saw it as an industry or lots of industries, I mean, it, it's so diverse that you know it's 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 easy it's it's easy to slip into thinking of just one industry. It's it's a multiple number. I suppose the the observation point uh, for for me was it was an industry that probably talked uh, in terms of its own uh, jargon and, 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 and technical nature rather than, you know, an, an industry that talked much more about the input than the output. But the actual output of this industry is just phenomenal. You know, you know homes for people and, and a home makes a phenomenal uh, impact on people's, you know, health and well-being. You know, the, the fact that, you know, we are creating environments where people can live, work and play and, and feel safe and secure. I mean, you know, there's so many incredible things that that, 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 that maybe one of the industry's big challenges is that, you know, how do you talk about the output of the industry rather than the input and transactional nature of it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was attracted because I saw something that could seriously contribute a, a real purpose in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's similar for me. I wanted to join because I wanted to shape the environments that people interacted with. And I think that that's definitely one of the real positive um, perceptions that I have is that the people working in this industry, you you do shape anything that you touch, essentially. Um, but I mean, so with Creation, we ran a survey last year and we asked young people, um, what would they change about the industry? 
and the biggest segment of responses gave answers to do with diversity and the next was was the culture um so that's kind of what what the young people were saying um so following on from that i mean what do we think some of the structural barriers are that are preventing this more diverse and inclusive workforce um sean i'll, I'll start with you look i think you know if, if you sort of peel back i mean even if you look at rics which is one professional body in a whole industry of industries uh, within within the built environment you know if if i go back you know even just 10 years ago you know you, you had to have a degree to to enter the profession which clearly you know created huge barriers uh in, in particularly in terms of social mobility and, and so on and i think you know the industry and the leaders in the industry have worked tremendously hard to open the industry up you know the whole you know growth of apprenticeships and so on has had a phenomenal impact so i think many of what i might call the might have been quite exclusive barriers to entry, I think have been removed from that point of view. I, I think that, you know, in terms of, you know, continuing to build, clearly you need, you need over a period of time to create uh, more diverse leaders. I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, people attracted into industries where they can see people like them who can make it, you know, and I, and I do think that there's a, there's a whole journey here in terms of, the future leadership of the industry but i think there's two bits to that that are really important you you need to be able to see visible role models you know and and that's a critical thing you know and i think as leaders you know we, we need to work really hard on ensuring that we you don't end up with the same scenario where you know whereas it's all in the nicest possible way white middle-aged men all on a panel speaking about diversity or anything like that i think we've gone quite a long way and uh, and i personally don't speak on panels that 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 don't have diversity on them you know because i think it's critical for the role models but equally i think we've got to be a little bit fair to leaders and ceos here which is how do we make the conditions right that they can equally have those honest conversations without, in, in the nicest possible way, feeling at risk of saying the wrong thing or being closed down. So I, I think visibility of up and coming role models is critical, uh, but equally, I think we've got to encourage the leaders in the industry to feel brave and have the right conversations about the need for change. No, I definitely agree, um, Sean. Aisha, I'll come to you. Um, do you think there are any structural barriers that are preventing diversity or things that can still be improved? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to say that I think, you know, a lot of what Sean says really um, echoes with me. In terms of structural barriers, I think, um, you know, some of them have been changed, for example, as, as Sean said, to do with, you know, degrees and there being a lot more apprenticeships. Um, I think there are some other barriers which aren't necessarily structural, but, you um, things to do with, you know, retention. Um, if, if you're going to have role models or people who've been in the industry so that, you know, people coming in can look look to and say, right, I, you know, they're like me, et cetera, then you need to be able to retain diverse talent. And I think that's a something that's a particular struggle for a lot of organizations and a lot of companies. So it's, it's starting to look at why is that a problem and how do you address that? And I think that also ties into some of the things that Sean mentioned around there needs to be a platform where there can be open, honest dialogue. There, it needs to be a platform where, you know, the leaders and the people at the top can openly talk about what they're experiencing in terms of their businesses, but equally for people in the industry. So for the employees to be able to talk openly about how they feel and, you know, what they're experiencing. The only way that change is going to come about is if that open dialogue takes place. And I think there needs to be a bit of leeway on both sides to allow for, you know, people sometimes will say the wrong things, um, but we, we can't sort of jump on each other and attack each other. Otherwise, no one is going to want to speak up. And if that happens, then we're not going to have any change. Um, so I say that's definitely something that I think uh, needs, to, needs to be focused on. I think that's a really point, a really good point there. And um, I think, as Sean mentioned, we have some fantastic leaders in the industry who are who are doing this. And 
from from creation i speak to a lot of apprentices at the moment and, and they've come to me because their ceo has asked to sit down with them to get their views and have that dialogue and that conversation and it's really positive to to see that um I mean, Melanie, sean what's, has been oh, doing sorry. that sorry sean has has actually been uh they've been doing this so i know that it's one thing to talk about something but when you can find people who practice what they preach uh, i think it's important and you know i i know that sean has been working on some initiatives where he's you know been having those awkward conversations i think other other leaders need to have them too i mean i agree with everything that's been said and i think if you look at the egi survey that was published last week you know there's clearly um, a gap into which those honest conversations need to come because there's you know there's a mismatch between um, how different people feel about their lived experience and where the leaders think they're taking their businesses and what they're trying to in inculcate throughout the whole organization um, so we you know we, we know this is a journey we know this is not you know something that we're ever going to say we've got right and done and we can now move on um, but I think in moving that journey on I think some of the points that Sean and I should have talked about are really, really important, actually. And I've you know, certainly, you know, as a, as a white middle class female coming into the industry, you know, I've, I've felt that fear about how do I approach something? How do I say, make sure I say the right thing and more importantly, don't say the wrong thing. And it can potentially get in the way and stop you from starting the conversation or initiating, you know, or saying what you really want to say. So I think, you know, I think Aisha's absolutely right. We can kind of take that fear factor out and say, it's, it's okay to get this wrong. The important thing is that you come honestly wanting to have a conversation, wanting to understand what you can do. Um, that, that's the most important thing. Um, in, in terms of structural barriers, I guess, um, I don't have much to add, except maybe to say that I, you know, I come back to something I said right at the start, which is I don't, we're still not talking to um, different people by and large. You know, there's fantastic stuff going on but by and large, you know, we're still in, a, in an environment where, you know, if you're offering an internship, you know, it, it's probably someone you know, because you know, they need it just as much as other people do. But actually, if you're going to make a real difference, you have to say, no, I'm really sorry, but we're not going to do that. Or we're going to do that, but we're also, as I know, um, some of the agents are doing, you know, we, yes, okay, fine, we'll do that. But we also will do something for someone completely outside anything anybody knows you know if we only keep going to people we know or extend the people the net of people we know um we're only ever going to get so far actually the brave thing to do is to go to places we don't know at all and to try and make a difference there I, I, can i just echo something that melanie said i think going to places that we've never seen or been to before i think is absolutely critical and you know i i would say the the underlying very positive trends that we're seeing particularly for the surveying profession start from that point Melanie I mean we, we've been particularly in the context of the UK looking to go into schools where there's a higher propensity of free school meals you know that would not have been the place that in the, we would have turned up to talk about becoming a chartered surveyor in the past and I, and I think really really critical um, you know that they tend to have you know higher populations of BAME students you know and that we are seeing coming through in 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 the beginnings of apprenticeship so if i just look at the apprenticeship uh, data you know 28 percent of apprentices are female and 13 percent are BAME and i think that's about the same percentage of the BAME working population so i do think you know going into places that we haven't been to before and having conversations about you know the incredible opportunities in the industry are really critical and i think we're also seeing as well as needing diversity in terms of gender mm -hmm. and race um the industry the skill set that we're needing for this emerging talent is changing and so um i guess getting people with a mm -hmm. more um, data background as well coming into the industry and attracting those people are, are really important I mean how do you think we go about attracting people who haven't necessarily thought about real estate as a career where their skill sets are more akin to these emerging talents Melanie we have I think we have to go out and talk about our industry um, there was some research that Sarah Hayford's um, consultancy published yesterday or a couple of days ago perhaps um, uh, about what students think about the property industry and um, 
surprise, surprise, only 10% were aware of opportunities in the property industry across the uh, students they surveyed. I think it was a thousand students. But what really struck me was um, that when they asked the students about whether they'd seen or um, met anyone from the property industry on campus, actually the number of places in which they said they had was really quite small and it was Oxford Brooks, it was Reading, it was the University of Westminster, it was the Royal Agricultural University, you know. So it feels like we're not going to places other than the places that the industry has historically drawn graduates from, um, which is, you know, just another presentation of the, of the same point. But, you know, we have to do better than that. And we have to go out and I hope Sean will forgive me because this is in no way to downplay the excellent, excellent work that the RSS is doing and the importance of the charter surveying profession. But we have to go out looking for skills and not for trying to sell people a particular career path. Now, why is it that the industry is recruiting people from you know, Tesco and um, digital startups? You know, it's because they recognise finally that we need very different skill sets. We need people who understand customers and we need people who understand technology, you know, and we have to go out and talk about the industry as a platform for a whole range of different kinds of skills and a whole range of different kinds of roles, as well as, you know, protecting the importance of the really um, refined and developed skills that we need, whether it's planning or surveying. Aisha, what about you? I would just echo a lot of that. Um, I think we can also look to some other industries that, you know, that do something similar. So in financial services, you know, my background before I went into that, I was a physicist. And at the time I sort of said, why would an investment bank want to speak to physicists? But they realized that it was about going out and finding you know, people who don't have financial services backgrounds who are doing something different because you get different skill sets and diverse people. And I think in this sector, it can be the same. So it's, as Melanie said, it's not typically going to those you know, universities where you know, we know that people go when they want to come into the sector. It's about why aren't we going to broader universities talking to students who are doing all kinds of different courses, um, because that's where you'll get the, the di diversity of thought um, and also diversity of, of, of the actual people. Um, and it, it's just about marketing. People don't know enough about the built environment sector, about all of the roles and the opportunities that are available. So unless we're going out there and telling them about it, there's no other way for them to, to find out. And I don't actually think it should be reliant on the RICS or any one body to do this. Every firm, every organization has a responsibility. There should be, you know, at some level, um, you know, uh, a sort of wider joint effort, but everybody has a, a responsibility to do what they can to, to get out there and to, to share what they do and the various roles. Um, and that's the only way that I, that I see things changing. You've got to ignite sparks into people's minds about the careers. And the earlier you do that, the better. University is great, but I'd even say go younger than that and start to go into school. You know, my daughter's, my daughter's three and has already told me she wants to be a fireman, but that's because um, they, you know, that's what she's been being talked about. But I, you know, I keep talking to her about the property industry, obviously because of my background, but, you know, imagine if you were reaching minds when they're very, very young, and then they're consistently seeing that as they're growing up. By the time they get to the point where they're going to be choosing a career, it's not going to be something um, that they're hearing about for the first time. I, I think that there, Aisha, I think there's a really interesting link there, which is, you know, I, I've seen now different organisations positioning the nature of their organization so uh you know one of the uh, individuals who you know i've met in my travels a chap called bob corto who um was the um chief exec of altus group he, he very much reimagined the organization and, and rather than it being an organization that does valuation transaction and whatever he was one of the first people to say, look, actually, we're a technology company that actually works with data, you know, that, that, that is in the real estate space. And, and I think there is a whole piece here about perhaps reimagining and recommunicating some of those links and opportunities so that they become a lot clearer. I mean, if you're in a, if you're interested in technology, if, if you're interested in data, if you're interested in looking at you know, and analysing trends and so on, that actually this is an industry that would be really welcoming of, of those skills. But it, it, it almost creates, 
it almost requires a need for leaders maybe to represent their organisations in a way other than the way that we talk about them today. And I think, um, you know, actually you made a really interesting point about, you know, your daughter's three and she's already talked about wanting to be a fireman when she grows up. Um, well, I tried to know, tell her firewoman, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, fi firefighter, please, firefighter. Exactly. Um, but that's possibly because there are, um, as, as young people, you're exposed to a lot of things through TV shows, through movies. Um, you don't see um, many programs based around people being surveyors or working in real estate. You've got suits about legal team. You've got Fireman Sam. Um, I mean, is there a surveying movie in the pipeline that the RSCS are backing, Sean? That's a great idea. There should be because yeah, that, that's how you well, get into, a, into young there's men. There's a big gap in the market now. The Bond movie's not coming out. So uh, <laughs> you know, it could be the answer. Look, I think I, I, I'm back to Melanie's point. I think that there is a danger here of it just being a surveying led thing. I think actually we've got to be, begin by joining up across industries, employers, professional bodies, associations. This is about how do you encourage, encourage people into the built and natural environment. And, and I think that's the way that we've got to be thinking. I do think that we, we tend to go down to, well, how can we get more people being quantity surveyors or valuers? Actually, I think that the, the, the lens that we should be competing on is how do we make the built and natural, natural environment a really interesting and attractive place for people to come? Because that's, that's the way, you know, people decide on you know where they're heading rather than a, a particular sort of sub-discipline or specialism or anything else so yeah I look I think there are many opportunities but but it's going to require an industry working much better in collaboration than probably it's ever done. And I think that's a good point and, and people can kind of journey through um, you know what what their plans are in the industry I'm I'm doing something very different now to what I thought I was going to be doing I thought I was coming in to be a property developer I, I work for CBRE in, in consulting um, and so actually the, the point is how do we retain people once we've attracted them to the industry as well and have helped them have a successful thriving career and they might meander through different different disciplines um, but yeah there's a there's a lot there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and it's how do we open those doors and make sure everyone has that 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 same access to those opportunities harry i think it also comes back to something sean said right at the start in terms of outputs and outcomes i mean we can do all of that but unless people's lived experience of what we do in developing in regenerating in you know creating spaces you know is positive as well then all of that good work is for nothing, actually. You know, you have to, we have to live our values in our outputs and outcomes for local communities, as well as in how we try to treat our workforce and how we try to develop our workforce and make them feel included um, within our industry. So we need to very much to look out and be thoughtful and reflective on the impact we're having, um, as well as think about what we need to do internally to change and make ourselves better. And that will help retention. Yeah. An interesting observation then for you that just leapt le into my mind as you have you said that Melanie is it's it's really uh, you know when you're building a brand and uh, Aisha you, you you know all about this and marketing and, and, and growing the image of an organisation it's really interesting the the industry tends to communicate the things that it doesn't like about itself much much more than the things it really does like about itself and, and all i would say is that in my background in all the industries that i've been in actually you've got to get on the front foot you've got to be talking about all the things that are really positive rather than in, in the nicest possible way you don't lead with all the reasons why you shouldn't do something and i, and I do think the industry has a little bit of a you know, I, I hear it on, on panels and, and, and everything, you know, and, and, and you know, my, my background's very different, but I do often hear the industry leading with the downsides. That doesn't tend to be the way of uh, really engaging people rather than the incredible things it does. You know, I, I think that's a really important element in this. I'd say that it, you can even do a bit of both. Absolutely, you've got to lead with the, the positive things, but I think if you can also mention some of the things which are least positive, but then say, you know, but we're, we, we're dealing with it, you know, we're yeah. putting this in place or yeah. that in place, then I think it, 
that's even more positive because when somebody's looking at it, they can say, right, here are all the benefits and these are all the things that I'm getting. And I'm going in with my eyes open. So here are all the things that I may not like, but actually there are these things in place to help mitigate. And I think whatever sector you're looking at, there are going to be positives and negatives. It's just the, the way the world works. But um, I think it's about getting balance. But as you said, Sean, putting the best foot forward, particularly in terms of the marketing and the branding. And so I guess another important point to touch on is sometimes when you talk about, you know, enhancing diversity and inclusion and we want to get skill sets from elsewhere, you know, we might look in different places. Um, you sometimes come across people's concern. What does it mean for me? Or people are worried that, you know, if they're doing a, a traditional real estate course at a traditional real estate university and suddenly companies are putting a lot of importance on looking beyond those, that they are worried that means less opportunity for them how do we tackle that that kind of perception I really think that there's more than enough roles and um you know opportunities for for everybody so I, I don't think that should be a concern for people I, I, I see Harry as just a massive opportunity I, I I you know again if I go back to my experience in financial services uh, and probably I Asia you'll be, be similar i mean you had people who you know you, you needed their text their, their technical expertise you know because you know otherwise you know in the nicest possible way the crazy people in the marketing department would come up for all sorts of things but they might lose millions so you know you you, you needed a you needed a combination of you know of skills in, in an organization you know that that sort of creativity entrepreneur pushing the boundaries you know, and you needed people who could really evaluate the risks, really understand uh, what was going on. And I think you need that in a thriving environment. And, and uh, you know, and equally, you know, I think that, you know, perhaps people who come in with just, uh, you know, maybe some of the creative skill, the entrepreneurial skill, they need to learn an element of the technical skill as well, because that helps solutioning in the same way round. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a, and I've seen it, you know, where you've got that sort of tension, you know, or, or almost, I think you get the best solutions and the greatest levels of creativity. So I think that's where thought diversity and the way people really approach problems with a different mindset actually opens up phenomenal change and opportunity. I agree with all of that. I guess I just had being slightly brutal, <laughs> um, you know, that a fair chunk of people who might feel threatened um, are actually facing up to the fact of their entitlement and their, the fact that they've had advantages that others haven't had. Um, and if that's a good thing, actually, um, some people need, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a privileged white middle class female. And so, you know, uh, I hope I can, you know, be honest about that. You know, um, the truth of the matter is that they have had all sorts of, I, I feel like I've worked really hard to get where I am and I feel like I've got here on merit. But, you know, there've been all sorts of advantage, natural advantages built into my life that have enabled me to get to here. Um, and if it makes people feel uncomfortable and reflective and realise that that's maybe true for them too, then that's a good thing that needs to happen. It's not about giving somebody an opportunity or a role just because they're black or because they're a woman. It's about ability. Completely. So if you're, look, if you're looking at somebody and saying, right, do they have the ability to do this role? that's why they, they're going to move forward or they're going to, to progress. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, for those people who were saying, okay, well, what's going to happen about me? Is something going to change? Well, if you're good enough, then, then no, it shouldn't. But if you're not good enough and there is somebody else who is, who is different, who is better, well, then they should get that opportunity. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much with you there, Isha. I, I think that, you know, again, one of the, one of the really important bits I, I think in, in, in the conversation about that opportunity is, is to make sure that, you know, when we're looking at roles, you know, when we are, you know, recruiting, that we are really open. <laughs> because I think that, you know, the, the danger in, in many organisations is you can almost just create a perpetuation of what you had. If you're not permanently coming back and thinking about you know, what skills are you going to need for the future? You know, what sort of values and behaviours do you want to grow in your organisation? You know, and I think 
that that requires a bit of a challenge to 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 the leaders and the industry around sort of really being clear about the the, the nature of your organization and the talent you need so that it it does create an, a much more open mindset of what you're going to you know ultimately what you're going to recruit otherwise you know you could end up just recruiting in the same mold all the time and I, and I think that's that's an important one to uh, get the uh, mind moved on I remember talking to Chris Grigg about this a while ago he's done fantastic things at British Land I think um, and should be really proud of his legacy when he leaves there later this year but you know uh, managing and leading a truly diverse workforce is really difficult because by definition you're bringing in disruptive thinking you're bringing in people who are going to challenge who are going to think differently um, and that's fantastic and that has all the benefits that you talked about Harry right at the start in your introduction but it's really challenging it's much it's much easier to manage a group of people who roughly think like you and you know you might ask the old awkward question but I want to fall into line as soon as possible it's much much harder to lead a diverse disruptive group of free thinkers who want to challenge, who want to think differently, you know, that's, that's tough. That's really hard work. Yeah, and I think you're never going to learn something from someone who thinks and has the same experiences as you. You have to have that diversity to learn and grow. I mean, I'm privileged to work in a team that is very diverse, people from all different backgrounds. Um, most of them haven't come through a property, property um, pathway either. And so each person's brought different skill set from previous jobs or from different different things they studied at university and everyone working together, you approach things differently. And it's a it's lovely to see, but yeah, difficult to, to manage sometimes. Um, so I briefly just want to touch on um, the impacts of COVID. And do we think that there will be um, any negative implications on that in terms of the diversity and inclusion of the industry? Um, I don't I don't think so. Um, there's, no, there's nothing that I can think of um, that would sort of hamper or, or sort of stop, you know, the progression of diversity and inclusion in the industry on, on the basis of, of, of COVID. Um, I'd say, if anything, potentially the opposite. Um, I think just more, there's been more awareness um, around, um, you know, ethnic minority groups, just because of what's been going on um, and so I think there's more focus on on the group and industry sort of looking and saying right what can we be doing what should we be doing um, so I've, I've seen positive things I can't think of anything um, potentially negative and Sean so some of our the youngest in our industry have been working remotely over this this crisis and you know maybe they were used to sitting alongside their their manager and learning from them I mean how do we how do you think that that what, what are, are there any impacts of that no, well, I, I think I think there is if you if you think about development in the way you've always done development you know and, and I think um, you know this is where managers you know I think if anything we've seen in this whole period of COVID you know some tremendous resilience creativity you know, looking and finding new solutions. And I think you need to take that into the same context of of development. And I, I suppose we can't have and got to shake off the fact that, you know, the way we always used to train people is they sat next to us and, and that's going to be different. So come up with a with a with a new way of doing that. And, you know, I think we've got to be able to help people, you know, you know, digital works really well in this environment where you've got the networks, you've got the connections, but breaking into that is the harder bit. And I think it's going to be about, you know, encouraging managers to facilitate a different type of networking and development in organisations to, to give people a, a, a different hand in, in, in being able to, you know, feel comfortable in reaching out and having conversations that you would have otherwise been able to do by walking around the coffee machine, standing by the printer, you know. So I think it's it's about challenging our mindset as to how we develop uh, talent in organisations in a in a very different way. But I think it's it's eminently doable. But we've got to move our mindset of how we used to do it. Amelia, I know BPF have been um, moving, they, they've been keeping this education going and move their, moving their events and series virtually online, um, making sure that people retain this access to, to knowledge and education. Um, so that's really positive to see. 
Yeah, I, that's right. We've, it, Sean's right. We just have to stop sort of trying to think how do we replicate what we used to do? It's how do we, what, what do we want to achieve by what we were doing and how do we do that in a different way? Um, and we found, you know, some really positive things. I mean, people like to come together. The industry is a very sociable industry. We like to meet each other. I've got a colleague who joined the BPF uh, during lockdown who's never met <laughs> most of the rest of his colleagues in the BPF, you know, and he's very keen to see the office and to, to meet his colleagues. And you know, that, that will not change. But actually, you know, there are some positives about this in terms of the way we've been able to reach out to members. You know, our, our regional policy committee used to meet um, three times a year wandering around the country, it's now meeting six times a year. It will always carry on meeting six times a year and we'll do half of them virtually and half of them physically. So, you know, that's actually driving better engagement for us with some of our members than we had before. And I'm really keen that we capture the positives of that um, as we hopefully start to be able to meet each other physically again sometime realistically, you know, next year. Um, I, I, I'm with you, Melly. I, I think the danger is a desire to get back to the old without yeah. taking all of the fantastic innovations that, you know, look, clearly we're dealing with a very difficult health crisis for the world and the economic impacts, but we've all learned some tremendous new things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about bottling that and making sure that we, we don't slip back. I mean, you know, we've seen just at RICS, the increase in engagement digitally has been phenomenal and, and, and actually far exceeds the model that we ever had in history. So let's not, <laughs> let's not try and, you know, go because actually we'd be engaging less people. So let's take the best of everything. And I do think we've got an opportunity to, to build back better in a very, very different way. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, I feel very positive about what's going to happen. And also I think to I should... the reach as well being digital you can reach so many more people and more demographics than you otherwise would have done yeah. had you had say a networking event you yeah. know certain certain groups of people may not have felt comfortable being there but it's actually the barriers to sort of switching your zoom on is, is much lower so i think you can engage with different groups of people as well excellent point yeah excellent point. well thank you everyone that's been a really great um, discussion. We've talked about the importance of visible role models and how we can inspire the next generation. Um, we're running out of time now, but I just wanted to test you all with saying one thing that you love about the industry to finish off with. So what would you tell someone to inspire them to come? I'd say the range of opportunity. Um, in you know, Historically, when someone has thought about a career or definitely in the past, it was sort of go into something and then you'll stick at that for 30, 40, 50 years. But with this sector, you can start in one thing, you can change multiple times still within the same sector and get massive breadth and depth of experience of different things. Thank you. Melanie? Um, I'd say making a difference in people's lives. It's an industry that can make a difference for everybody. Very, very similar. I, I think, you know, this is, a, this is an industry that can shape the way the world lives, works and plays. And I think that it, it has a massive contribution to some of the biggest challenges that the world faces in the future. Well, thank you everyone for your time today. And I hope everyone watching has found this interesting and has left with more than they came.